There we Look go. Look at that. Yeah. There we go. What's up, man? Good, good to see you. Good to see you. I, I, I heard you were going to be wearing black, so I decided to do the same thing and just color coordinate with Brandon Turner today. I, I should have got my blue light behind me. We both have like fancy cameras and everything. <laughs> Oh, that's well, awesome. That's awesome. Good to see you again, man. I always love talking to you about this stuff because you know, co-living is one of my favorite strategies. I it's probably the number one thing I'm recommending these days for new investors mm -hmm. who are getting started. And I'm like, because they're like, it just doesn't work. And I'm like, it works this way. I mean, literally earlier, yeah. and I'm gonna ask you about this later. Literally, I was doing a coaching call this morning. I do very rarely I'll do like paid coaching calls and stuff. Uh, and I was doing a call with a guy who was just like, I can't find any deals in my area, there's nothing there. So we pull up the yeah. MLS. And I'm looking at the looking at the house. And I'm like, yeah, man. Like, the, you know, the rents are, are are okay, but the prices are pretty high. And you know, at this interest rate, doesn't work. And I was like, wait, let me try something. And I, I pull up a four bedroom house, and I start playing with the numbers. I'm like, dude, this thing. I think we can get fifteen hundred dollars a month in cash flow out of it. And I'm like, I'm like, that's like a twenty percent cash on cash return your first year. And it blew the guy's mind. Blew my mind. And I was like, man, why don't I do more of this? So. <laughs> anyway, excited to dig in with you, with you today. But before we get to that, tell us who you yeah, are and uh, yeah, how, how'd you get into this world of real estate investing? Where did that come from? Yeah, man. First, thanks for having me on. Good to see everybody on today. I'm I'm excited to just kind of share a little bit about co-living and, and my story. So yeah, we can take this any, any direction you want to go, Brandon. But um, I got started in the world of real estate investing. My first, um, my first, my mom, way, way back. I, I don't know how far you want me to go back, but way sure. back, way back. Birth, I was, I man. In, Start at birth. Yeah, birth. <laughs> there you go. Okay. We're going to be here a while. We have two hours, right? <laughs> Perfect. Um, but um, yeah, my mom put me in martial arts. And so martial arts was like my passion. And then I got into the business side and I started building these martial arts schools. And it was the thing I thought I was going to be in for the rest of my life. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I think it was a martial arts instructor actually, who was like a business guy too, who was like, Hey Sam, like skim some money off the top. And then obviously in go abundance, those guys really kind of encouraged me like skim some money off the top. Like your business might be doing well now, but every small business owner, like we all say the same thing, right? We're all like, I'm just putting all my money back into the business. And it's like, that sounds cool. And it's kind of a nice excuse sometimes for why you're not making profit, but you've really got to like, pull some off the top and put it into what they called and what people taught me is like a second engine. And mm -hmm. so that second engine was real estate for me. I was like, I was actually making great money running my martial arts company. I was building that. I thought I'd never, ever, 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 ever be out of that. And I thought that would never, you know, in no way could I ever get shut down for like, what, six months, eight months. Like that would never happen. Right. Um, which obviously never. it did during COVID, but, um, it was really, really good advice. And so I just started doing what probably everybody on this call knows as house hacking, where I'm just like, and I come from a big family. I've got eight brothers and sisters, mom, dad, 1900 square foot house. We got 10 people, 1900 square feet. So this idea of house hacking or co-living was just <laughs> not a stretch for me. Uh -huh. um, and so I just started renting out rooms. I remember the one of the first houses when I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, I bought this house. And I remember moving in. My first thought was just like, it's just too quiet. Like I need commotion. I need people. So I threw a room up for rent on Craigslist. Had this guy from Mexico that was here on like a seven month contract at Bank of America. We just hit it off. And it's kind of like started as this fun experience. And it was, um, it was actually that house kind of the, the, the aha moment for me was that house I ended up renting three additional rooms. I took like an L shaped living room and put a wall, put a door, made a little closet, put a half bath, you know, in the, turn the half bath into a full bath. And, um, one of my friends who was a, a big time banker and just really good with numbers. He was, we were out walking one day or going for a run. He was just like, Hey, how much are you renting that house for? I know you're like, I know you're doing the room rental thing. I was like, Oh man, it's like, if I count myself as a renter, like 2850. And he was like, dang, dude, that house would only rent for like, at the time that house would only rent for, uh, <laughs> we got a guest. I love it. We got uh, a little guest. Yeah. I love that. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Um, <laughs> He's just sticking his tongue out, ready to go. Let's go. He said that house would only rent for thirteen hundred dollars on on the at the time, and so he's like, "You're more than doubling the rent on that home, um, by doing that little room rental strategy." And he's like, "That's pretty cool." And um, so I kind of went on a journey, being the crazy kind of just push everything to the max kind of guy that I am. I went on this journey of saying, "Well, if it works with four, could it work with five rooms? Could it work with six rooms?" Uh, could it work with seven? Could it work with eight? Could it work with nine? And I know it sounds crazy to a lot of people, but could it work with 10 people sharing a house together? I mean, that's what I grew up with, you know, and, and our biggest home right now has 11 rooms in it. And uh, so just going on that journey was really how this like co-living thing got started. And along that journey, obviously you figure out a lot of systems and I was just on this crazy journey to try to retire as fast as I humanly could. And this was 
to me and what I found the quickest path. And so I kind of made my life about it. And now I teach it and now we're building some and we've got a couple hundred properties and it, it feels good. Yeah, I was so, going to ask you how many do we how many doors do you have or, or homes? Like how do you how do you quantify what you've got right now? Yeah, we 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 count like because we rent these rooms out individually, we mm -hmm. we count them as one door. So if a house is six rooms, that's six doors, right? Because that could yeah, yeah. be half vacant, could be full, yeah. could be so it, you need to have that for just your numbers, right? Sure. So right now, my wife and I own, I think, 197 doors. I think we just did that number the other day, uh, co-living doors. And then we manage probably about 200 additional ones. So we have about 400, maybe 450 now because we're adding a bunch of homes this next month. So yeah, somewhere between four and 500 and, and growing really rapidly in terms of just the number of co-living doors that we're operating. And then in my group, in my, in my, the people that I manage and coach and teach, probably 1,500 kind of around the United States and in, in most major markets. Yeah, it's legit, man. All right, so let's go into yeah. the the details of how co living works. So first of all, the the natural reaction anytime I talk to somebody about this, they're like, "Oh, that sounds terrible. I would never want to rent out a bunch of bedrooms to somebody. That sounds awful." What's your response to that? Yeah, my my response is kind of just to tell two quick stories that everybody will will definitely remember. And one was when Uber first came out, and everybody said you're going to go pick up a random stranger on an app, and you're going to go pick them up, and they're not going to mug you, they're not going to kill you, and you're going to drop them off at another undisclosed location, and this is going to be the newest greatest thing, and it's going to be awesome, and you'll never be in a taxi again. And we all thought, yeah, that's a stupid idea. That'll never work, and everybody's going to die. And now we have Uber. Honestly, yeah. for those that were around and, you know, we, we seem to forget really easily when these new things come up. But I remember when Airbnb first came out, yeah. it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Brandon, you're yeah. going to rent your second home mm -hmm. to a bunch of teenagers on an app that you've yeah. never met before. And they're not going to like, just destroy your house. Like that'll never work. Like, ha ha. And now we have Airbnb, right? Cause they figured out those nuances, those details to make it happen. And so co-living is a blue ocean uh which is which is which is you know this this free place where it's like yeah it's it's there's early adopters so it's it's if you want to be on the beginning stages of something and kind of be able to ride that wave now's the time to ride it now if you're like oh no 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 no, i want to wait till everybody has figured out every nuance to this that'd be like buying an airbnb now you're, you're not yeah. you're not coming in at the top you're coming into a somewhat already saturated thing right and so it just depends on I, I teach that every investment has a life cycle just like a human being right it's it's born and it has all the you know it's, it's, it's a toddler and then it's got it's a young adult and then it's a teenager and it goes and then it eventually dies and you think about like 401k right it's like what's yeah. it's run it's a good course everybody has figured out how to get their fees out of a 401k everyone's figured out how to how to tax the 401k in the perfect way and and that's 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 a very mature investment but it's also like more of a red ocean where there's a lot of people kind of fighting for a piece of the pie i think in some areas airbnb is a red ocean it's everybody's fighting for the piece of the pie i mean brandon i i mean so i'm in ash i'm in charlotte north carolina but i've got airbnbs in Asheville, north carolina we sold off a bunch to, to redeploy into co-living but and this person launched an airbnb with a bowling alley yeah they got <laughs> bowling alleys swimming pools pickleball courts, basketball yep. courts. I mean, it's like, holy cow, like I can't compete with that. I, I just put a sauna and I thought it was doing a cool thing recently. They were putting a sauna in one of my Airbnbs. And it's like, these guys are launching these Airbnbs with 49 uh, amenities and counting. But anyway, I digress. Back to you. <laughs> I, I love it, man. All right. So when, who are we renting to in a situation like this? Like who's going to rent a room in a house when they can just go get a apartment? Why would they do that? And who are they? I mean, I think one of the coolest things about co-living, and I know um, Mitch was on here earlier and he was talking about how like there's there's some cool elements to this that we're getting to help other people. And so yeah. the cool thing about co-living is um, when you have a co-living home, you break it up into bedrooms, you rent out bedrooms, you were introducing to that market, let's say Charlotte a price point that did not previously exist. Yeah. So if the lowest price point in Charlotte is about thir you know, anywhere from 11 to $1,300 for a studio apartment, that is the lowest price point you're going to get if you want to be on your own. Um, we can introduce something that's $700 a month. We yep. can, all utilities included. So we're about 50% when you count that you got to pay utilities on that studio. So who's renting that is really like anybody making $50,000 a year or less, yeah. $60,000 a year or less. I think I heard you say something recently about like someone's working at Starbucks. They're making $18 an hour. They are not renting all in $1,500 a month studio apartment because after taxes, that's yep. 65 to 70% of their income yeah. after taxes. Yeah. It just, the I math doesn't add up. 
It doesn't. And I think, you know, I mentioned earlier, I use a, I use a metaphor when talking about assisted living. I said, there's a giant whale coming. And if you want to get, you want to get in front of the whale, if you're paddling out there on a paddle yeah. board, you want to get in front of the whale yeah. and you see the whale coming and old people retiring and needing assisted living, that's a giant yeah. whale. But the other yeah. giant whale is affordable housing and everybody knows it and everyone sees it and the politicians are shouting i mean just today like the biden's introducing or trying to propose like rent control they don't know what to do the government doesn't know what to do and so the government yeah. says like let's just jack up interest rates well what's that doing that's just <laughs> causing more problems raising rents even higher yeah. okay we're going to lower interest rates everyone's going to buy all the houses they're going to jack up rent i mean everything they do yeah. is making the problem worse yeah so true, this dude. is a real solution to a massive problem. How do you become wealthy? You have real solutions to massive problems. And yeah. that's just, this is one of those. So anyway, this is why I'm excited about it is because it, yeah. it provides real value. It helps people. And like you said, it brings up a price point. And I mentioned earlier, I'm looking at that property. It was outside of Nashville. It was a yeah. 30 minute drive outside of Nashville. And uh, I'm looking at this house. And it's again, the cheapest, and you tell me where I'm off on this logic. Cause I'm not a co-living guy, but I, 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 this makes sense in my head. I go in, I look at this house, four bedroom house. It would rent for $2,500 a month as a normal rental. Uh, the yep. cheapest studio apartment in town was $1,299 for, for a studio apartment. Uh, and so I, my theory was I could get probably yeah, 800 to a thousand dollars for if this was a nice bedroom in a house. And right. I'm only 30 minutes from Nashville, which means I'm not just out in the sticks in the middle of nowhere. I'm getting somebody who in Nashville for a studio apartment, you're probably paying more than that. Would somebody drive into Nashville if they're working in Nashville? Would they drive 30 minutes to pay seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars in rent? My theory is yes. And so you can get good people that have decent yeah. jobs and just want to live cheaper. How, how does that logic yeah. make sense? Does that logic work? Yeah, I think so. I think we tell people a commutes distance to major employers, right? right? So if you're still a commutes distance and a commutes distance is very relative to that city, right? San Francisco is yeah. going to be different than Charlotte. It's going to be different than, than Nashville. Um, and yeah, I have a student who bought a big house. I mean, it was going to be like 12 bedrooms or something, something crazy. Um, and it was right next to the Grand Old Opry. I mean, it was right there, center of town. And they did a... And they, they had no problem filling rooms and no problem with, with, with really like getting, you know, but, but by, I, I guess, I guess maybe where I would just say is like, could you buy a nicer house closer to town yeah and still have it cash flow than have to go out where I'm, you know, I think what's cool about this model is so Sh Charlotte, you've got this belt, this beltway, right? And I think anybody can relate to this in any city. You've got kind of the tertiary markets, you know, and then you've got the light. Hey man, if I could buy a house and it would cash flow in town, like, oh, I'd, I'd heck yeah. love to do that because it's going to appreciate like crazy. And that's where we're, I mean, that is still where your max demand is, right? Like I'm 10, yep. 15 minutes from the airport, which is how many people, you know, those people are making 20 to $30 an hour. They're putting luggage yep. on your plane. They're doing all that. They're serving the thousands of people that come through there, you know, big Amazon warehouse center. So, so I don't, I think where people go wrong is sometimes with this model is they're like, cool. Like someone asked me today, what about Gastonia? Well, if you're in Charlotte, Gastonia is like 45 minutes from Charlotte. And it's, it's one of those areas where like housing still decently affordable in that area. And I was like, I, just buy, just buy a nicer house in town. Like you can still, <laughs> you can buy a house in Charlotte in the belt for still 400 K 350, 400 K you turn that into eight rooms. You're still cash flowing. Like you're still cash flowing probably two grand a month on that house. Like just do that. It's going to appreciate yeah. better. We know there's a market there. Now you have a little economies of scale. You can put two more there. So what we do before we go into a market like that and, and anybody listening, if you're like, Hey, yeah, would this work in my town is we do a little scrappy little play where we just run a test ad. So we'll just go to that area. We'll take some pictures. We'll hide the address. We'll post it on Facebook marketplace. And we'll be like room for rent. Yeah. And I know I get a lot of flack because people are like, that's face up, you know, and like before <laughs> we buy the house. Yeah, <laughs> but I, it, I love it. I love it. Yeah. But before you like go spend 300,000 or 400,000 or 500,000 dollars in a house, like go test it and like do the right thing. When people respond to the ad, like message them back and just be like, Hey, I'm actually creating a waiting list. Please fill out this form this is what we do. Please fill out this form. It'll get some data and you're going to be at the top of the waiting list. Right. And what happens is we at least have some data for how much, I mean, if I put this on Facebook marketplace and I do the, you know, the circle in Facebook marketplace, you just, you give it a yep. general area, but it's close enough where people know where that house is. 
and I get a hundred hits in four days, man, there's demand. If I get yeah. four hits in four days, either A, it's a crappy area or your price point is off. So then we'll test different price points. That's if I have no students, nobody in that area, that's how we test a market. And that's how I recommend people still test a market. It's the best. Yeah, it's brilliant. The only problem is you can't, and a lot of, a lot of people want to be like, a, they want to put like, you know, uh, test ad, or they want to put something in the copy of the ad. Yeah. Just, it's got to look real. That's what we there's found. A, there's a quote from Tim Ferriss that literally, I think I would say changed my life. It's just a simple thing, but I've used it a million times in business and marketing. Yeah. Never ask somebody if they would buy, ask someone to buy. Yeah. It's such a simple, <laughs> it's like, if you said, would you buy this? Everyone says yes. If you, if yeah. you said, buy this. So like when I, when I launched the book on rental property investing, the book I wrote, what, eight years ago, yeah. I made test ads and I made like 20 different ones, That's but it didn't awesome. say like, which cover do you like better? Cause that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. I just literally put a buy button on the ad and I did 20 different cover tests. <laughs> and, and the one that got the most clicks of buy now is the one we went with. And that's when that's we sold awesome. a million copies, right? We tested that's it awesome. the same way you're testing yours. Like yeah. you're like, Hey, this is a property for rent, you know, fill out the form, like fill out the form, make them click on it, make them go through it. Yeah. Now you actually have real data. So I love the testing idea uh, very much. So I'm going to answer or ask a few questions that came in here because I don't want to hug the mic the whole time. Uh, are you seeing, Parker said, are you seeing cities creating ordinances that only allow two non-related people or whatever to live together in a home? Uh, where we are, a college town, they've had that in play for years. So what are you seeing with the number of people can live in a home? Yeah, man, this is a, this is like a big topic. And we, I mean, we, I, I could honestly go on for this for 30 minutes. I mean, it's that big of a topic and there's that many, um, cases out there and different things happening. So there's, but I'll kind of, I'll kind of highlight a couple of the big things when we get into those, those things. So first of all, we use a strategy when I first started kind of pushing the limits on mm -hmm. these homes, I reached out to a company, which probably everybody here has maybe at least heard of if you're in this market, and that's PadSplit. And PadSplit, it doesn't, PadSplit is really just like a platform to list your home on to rent the rooms out. That's really what it is, right? So I, I but I reached out to them and I knew that they were in like 40 different markets in the United States. I knew that they had, you know, upwards of 10, 12 people sometimes sharing in a home. And I just was like, hey, what, how many times have you guys sh been shut down? And the CEO was like, well, why don't you talk to the, our head legal counsel? He used to be one of the big legal counsels for the NRA. So he's used to playing in some creative spaces, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, so he, he reaches out and he basically, he said, look, we've never been shut down. And I said, man, how have you done that? That's crazy. I mean, cause, cause these rules, the same thing that whoever just meant, made that comment made of like two, these unrelated rules. And he goes, well, first of all, we, we kind of deploy several different strategies. He's like, number one strategy is trash cans and grass. I'm like, what trash cans and grass? What does that mean? He's like, if you leave the trash cans on the street for two weeks, you're going to have problems with the neighbor. Like he's like, it's, you just have to be like, like smart. And like the, the grass has to be cut and the trash cans has to be like taken in. Like, and, you, and those are all nuanced systems. Cause like not yeah. one person's in charge of the house. Like if you're renting out, he's like, that will, he's like, that is literally 99% of our issues. He's like, if that, if that is taken care of, you know, the code compliance system, he's like, these are not party houses. These, these aren't Airbnbs. These are quiet professionals that are living the place. Never rarely if ever have parties like yeah. You just don't get complaints on them. He's like, but number two, we have this strategy where we have a company that owns the home. XYZ investor owns the home and all. And I'm not a lawyer and I'm not giving you people legal advice on this call, but I'm just sharing a little bit about what we do. And he goes, what we do is we lease that home to one other entity. And, and in that entity, um, that entity is a membership based company. So technically I'm leasing my company to one other company. And that entity has, could have hundreds of members and those members don't, they don't sign a lease. Actually, the first thing on their agreement is this is not a lease. It's a membership agreement. Think similar to a fraternity club, similar to, sim similar to country club. You're joining a country club and they have access to that house. They get access to use that house. And there's some other nuances to that, but at a high level view, that was one of the biggest strategies that they used to say, hey, these are not permanent residents. Yeah. Like, sure, you can rake, maybe you can. And by the way, Pad Split right now is making a huge case that is completely unconstitutional to regulate uh, related people in a different way than unrelated people. And actually like their whole goal is like, they want to go to the Supreme court with that very yeah. argument. Like this yeah. is unconstitutional. Um, so I'm kind of hitting on some of the major points, but that's one of the main uh, loopholes, if you will, and how they've gotten uh, uh, around that is to say, these are not permanent residents. These are members of a club that have access to this house. 
what? Like you're ta- you're telling me that John down the street can't have six friends over for a, a three weeks, seven <laughs> friends over for a month. Like that's not illegal. But th- so it's a it's a little bit of an interesting area. Now you also have to recognize that most of these like most of these like uh, unrelated people rules and 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 zoning restrictions were created after World War II. They were created to um, really manage like undocumented workers living in homes and prostitution houses was two of the main ways. And a lot of them just flat out, if you dig into the code, and I've done this a lot now, they're just discriminatory in a huge way. Like right now there's a county in Atlanta that reads like this, up to four unrelated, unlimited related, and an unlimited number of domestic servants. Like that's <laughs> literally how it's written. And it's like, guys, come on. This is so pad splits, probably the biggest on the legal side of things. Yeah. Same thing for me. We've, we've created the membership agreements. I have membership agreements in almost all of my homes. Now we've been switching over kind of slowly as lease has been expiring. It's something we've been doing the last year. And so that's kind of one of our strategies and we've got our thing in place. There's also one more thing I'll just touch on. And that is there's, um, there's a rule I'm drawing a blank on it right now. It's called, uh, it's basically how the federal government defines a family. It's their way. It's called the uh, the equal access protection. I don't know. It's I, I'm drawing a blank on what it's actually called, but it's, but it's the federal government's stab at creating, here's what a family is and it is the most liberal um it's like regardless of sexual regardless of all these things you can be a family if you present yourself as a family is basically what the federal government yeah i we identify as a family should probably without going deep down that art like if you could identify as a as a dog, you should be able to identify as a family. So. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Which is one of the cases that we're making is like, hey, this is so we're seeing a lot of that. But here's here's what I'll say just to kind of put a bow on this. And again, I could keep going, but you got you'll probably have to cut me off on this, Brandon. But like, what we're seeing is like if Airbnb regulations are increasing, co living regulations are drastically decreasing. So I think they're like ships passing in the night. Great example of this was the governor, the governor of Colorado just came out. This is like 15 days old, by the way. And he said it is illegal for any local jurisdiction in the state of Colorado to regulate the number of unrelated people in any jurisdiction in Colorado. Wow. Like it's like it's and so so now there's a there's a state law protecting the co living thing because it's it's what people it's it cities are jumping on board and recognizing this is giving us housing yeah this is a solving our problem it's without subsidies yes it's the same as adus adus are falling state by like their their laws are passing state by state to allow adus because the government's like oh this is actually helping us the solution co-living the same way i think it's going to happen state by state or uh, supreme court federal level because Europe, I mean, Europe figured this out years ago. Europe's been doing co-living, I feel like, since before America was born. You know, like, that's like, it's much more common. I feel like when I, when I'm like my friends who live in Europe, like, yeah, I live in an apartment with four other people. Like, that's just a normal thing because their prices were high. They're they're having the same problems we are, but they just got it 20 years ago. So, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating, man. All right. Let me ask you a few more questions here. Uh, What's the ideal specs for a co-living house? Like, what kind of neighborhood? What kind of house? Yeah, you're probably looking at a C plus, a B neighborhood. You're definitely staying away from like probably like B plus or A neighborhoods. It just needs to fit, right? You're looking at some place that's got no HOA. It needs to have enough parking. If you're in a city where public transportation sucks, Charlotte sucks, Houston sucks. Like there's just some cities that like just don't have good public transport. So like we need to make sure you have enough parking. Our little rule of thumb is two thirds the number of parking spaces for how many people live in the home. So if I have a nine room home, I'm gonna have six parking spaces. And between people being out of town, between somebody uh, having a room flip, between someone being at their girlfriends, it's like, it always works. It always works. And so that's kind of what we've found. Um, and then from there, you're just looking for square footage, man. You're looking for the biggest home that you possibly can, because at the end of the day, you want to provide big rooms. You want to have people spread out as much as possible. Um, and so the bigger the home, the better. And then the last big, big thing I would just hit on would be the more bathrooms, the better, because you never really want to go above a three to one bedroom to bathroom ratio. So mm-hmm. three bedrooms sharing one bath, that's max perfect world. A lot of my homes are two to one. And then in a perfect, perfect, perfect world, you'd build these things, which is what I'm working on from the ground up and you'd build a one to one ratio. And that's yeah. really cool too. Yeah, let's talk about the builds. And you brought that up. The build to rent co-living, I think, is a fascinating model because you get to design a property that is perfectly geared towards what you're trying to do. You're not trying to make something work. So how is that going for you? What are you trying to do there? Uh, where do you see that going? Is it, I wish I could, man, I have this, I have a plan pulled up. It would be so yeah. cool if people could see it, if I could share my screen, but I, 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 don't, know if I, I, don't, uh, I don't know if a, I can or not. Yeah, give it a try. Oh, I oh wait, 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 I can, I can. Okay, okay cool. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, there we go. 
So this is what it looks like. These are the ones I'm building. I'm building four of these. Uh, we're permitting stage on all four. One one lot we're subdividing so we can get two on. Uh, it's very basic build, guys, if you're looking at this. It's just an, oh, so it's an over-under duplex, kind of a long shotgun-type building. Um, this is actually one. This is the this is the exact plans for one that was already built in Atlanta, not for me. And then what I'm going to do is let me just share, I think, the most interesting, the other most interesting thing will be the floor plan. So on the first floor, you've got bedroom, bathroom, bedroom, bathroom, and it's a little... I'm trying to zoom in for you guys. Oh, there we go. So we, ooh, too much. Bedroom, bathroom, bedroom, bathroom, bedroom, bedroom, another bathroom, nice little kitchen, dining area, living room, and office. Now, the guy that I had build this, he turned the living room and the office into two more yeah. bedrooms because he was like, look, everybody stays in their bedroom. They got a bunch of bathrooms and they have this cool kitchen, dining area. And then it's the exact same replica on floor two or floor one. I forget. This is actually. The ground level. So you got living room, office. Again, could be two bedrooms. Bedroom, 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 bedroom. So a uh, private bath. I'll just give you guys some quick math. Like in the towns where I am, in Asheville and Charlotte, North Carolina, private bath will go anywhere from 950 to 1050. And that's just based on like location, uh, how big the room is, how nice it is, how new it is, blah, blah, blah. And so thousand, so let's say low, let's take the low end of that 950. These are going to end up being 16 bedrooms if you converted each of these. Yep. and 12 full baths and we can build this not including land cost but a turnkey build price is 700k and that's like i just have to like just have to ink the contract with the contractor so you're you're basically getting so for 700k what are you getting you're getting a bedroom that's producing 950 um well once you do land cost i can buy a light so so it's gonna be about fifty thousand dollars per bedroom so you're yeah. almost hitting like this you're almost hitting this like 2%. Like that's almost a 2% rule is what that yeah. ends up being, right? Which like is pretty in, dang close. Which is pretty much, I mean, you can't even find 1% deals anymore, like across the country. Like it's very, very, very rare to find a 1% deal on a rental property. So to be able to pull out a 2% thing, I mean, like almost that's in, yeah. that's incredible. And the building, again, you got lower repairs, lower CapEx, yeah. lower everything, easier management, yeah. Man, everything is easier. I yeah, I think there's tremendous opportunity. And then it's like rinse and repeat. If this works the way you want it to, it's like, all right, let's do it. Let's do it 20 more times. Let's raise some capital and do this thing. Cause now you can bring in investors yeah. if you want. Like there's an interesting world in this for sure. That that excites yeah. me. I a hundred percent agree, man. All right. So how about some more questions? There's some questions about the management. How yeah. do you deal with a, a dirtbag tenant? How do you make sure they respect each other? Like I even most people haven't lived together since college. So how do you how do yeah. you make sure that works? Yeah, man. I mean, I think our first of all, you vet a tenant in a co-living building just like you would any other place. Like they need to be a good person. But the added the added thing that we do that's different from like just say you're putting someone in an apartment is what we call a vibe check. And it is just that. It is a in-person interview where we ask them some questions. And we get a vibe for if they're a good person. Now, you know, we offer one free transfer within the first 30 days when someone signs an agreement to kind of just like, if they're like, what if I don't like all these people in this home? And and it just kind of, that eliminates a lot of the issues. And we have enough, we have enough volume here where they can be like, look, I just, for whatever reason, okay, great. We'll transfer them to another room, no problem, free and get, you know, they don't have to pay any extra fees out of their membership agreement or anything like that. So that's kind of one way that we mitigate that. Um... Yeah, I mean, we rewrite our membership agreements or we write, you know, if you're doing leases, you got to write your lease this way to where you can evict somebody for a break of house rules. Now, obviously, it's going to depend on what state you're in. I'm in North Carolina. We are very landlord friendly. Go North Carolina. And so it is not hard to evict somebody in North Carolina. And it's not hard. You know, obviously, that's we'll terminate their membership first before we put an eviction on the record, of course, and be like, yeah. you have 30 days to leave because this yeah. is not working. And so we'll do that. And there's enough demand for that, that it's not like we're trying to, you know, it's just sometimes it's better just to get rid of someone and move them out and say, Hey, not a good fit. No harm, no foul. We're giving you 30 days, pay your last month rent and you're, and please find another place to stay. So we'll do that. We have like a member dispute portal where they can go in, they can scan a QR code in the refrigerator. And this may sound a little nuanced and it is a little nuanced, but it's, Hey, it's just one of the things that kind of comes along with the territory of this, of this, of this niche. They'll scan the QR code and they'll answer a bunch of questions. Hey, what's the situation? What's going on? And it's, it's just long enough where if it's not a real issue, they won't finish it, but it's short enough where if it is a real issue, we will hear about it. Yeah. And that could be as simple as, Hey, someone's vaping in the house. <laughs> like it could be that simple. Like I'm going to fill this out. It becomes a member concern. And then we just have a bunch of flows and scripts that our virtual assistant team handles and takes care of. And then it will escalate. There's warning one, warning two, warning three, and then it'll escalate to the point to where if it's a real issue, we'll, we'll ask them to leave. 
Um, you do get those people. They sneak through no matter how good you are vetting. You absolutely will get those people in the homes and they're a pain in the ass. Um, but usually once everybody knows, like in that house, so there's eight people sharing a house and there's one dirtbag person. Like once everybody knows, like we're getting them out, guys. Sorry, we made a mistake. They're cool. Yeah. It's like, all right, John's going to leave in 20 days. <laughs> like it, it, it yeah. Did, what is an eviction process is the same basically as a normal? Yeah. Just yeah, it's exactly the same. It's, it's exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. A few other questions. Let's see. Um, and in, uh, and in North Carolina, you can, you can yeah. evict someone in like 40 days. You, you basically can evict them in after 10 days of not payment. Yeah. It's fast. Like depending on the state. So yeah. be careful where you are in the yeah. state, but yeah. Okay. How long do you sign a lease for? Are they annual leases or, or what does that work for each person? So we do really membership. The membership. So what's yeah? The so we do these membership agreements on a, and um, yeah, we'll put a term on the membership agreement. We we used to not do terms on the membership agreement, but we we've kind of added back there that for some legal reasons around some of the code enforcement stuff that someone was asking in earlier. So we give we give you, you can you have the the option to do it right now, but usually yeah, twelve six month or you can do sixty day notice. We used to do just sixty day notice. We'll put someone in like give us a sixty day notice and you can move out. Um, but now we do twelve and six. Any different insurance requirements for co-living, like property insurance? You know, again, I'm not an I'm not an insurance expert. I can only tell you what I've done, and that is I just put normal, like this is a rental property, and I put insurance on it, and that just is what it is. And you know, the fact that I'm renting it to one other company, it's not like I'm actually I'm yeah. I'm, I'm renting it to a company, and I have one tenant technically of this company, and that is this company that's renting it from me, and they happen yeah. to have a lot of members, and they're using it for their purposes. Yeah. So again, check with your insurance agent just to, just to make sure. But you know, we've had we've had hundreds of thousands of dollars of claims on on properties that we've leased. Uh, um, on that note, do you have them get renter's insurance? Do you require that from your tenants? We don't we? Don't okay. maybe we should. Uh, yeah, I, have I, don't a staff I don't. I don't either. But I, I always yeah. think I probably should. But yeah. I know some people that just require it. It's like if you right. rent here, you got to pay the fifteen bucks a month for renter's insurance. And yeah. It, you know, I feel like the people that push that the hardest are the platforms that sell the insurance. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm always, <laughs> so I'm always like, hey, who's really making money on this? Me? Like, I don't understand. Yeah, yeah I'd be curious. I mean, we got a hundred landlords here right now. I mean, any of you guys <laughs> require it? I'd love to know some stories of anybody else in the comments wants to add anything in the chat. But uh, yeah, interesting. Um, all right, let's see. That's funny. Yeah. Next question. Financing. What has that been looking like to buy one? Uh, but all refine buying and refinancing, what has that been like? Yeah. So buying is going to be just like you're buying any rental, right? If you're buying it with a conventional loan, obviously it's going to be underwritten based on your income. If you're trying to buy it on some sort of debt service type product, you just got to know the right lender and we, we know the right lenders. And, and what they do is they basically like put they go to Air DNA. They take some ad data from Air DNA. They stick it on the the ten oh seven. They stick it on the rent appraisal, and like that. That's in essence what ends up happening. Yeah. Um, and, and, and in order to get it to debt, so if it doesn't debt service based on long term rents, you can you can get a little scrappy with an Air DNA play. Um, you can buy them with second homes. You can buy them with primary residences. <laughs> like I always tell people, like you can actually still buy. Like let's say each like we've we've. I've got a home right now. I've got a couple of people looking at homes that will that will net, you know, once they pay a property manager and everything, anywhere from two to three grand a month. And so I always tell people like, hey, if you're if your financial freedom number is let's say seven grand a month, you know, you need to make eighty four thousand dollars a year or eight grand a month, a hundred grand a year. So you like, granted, they have to be like amazing properties. This is not like the property you're just gonna find tomorrow, but like you look, you search, you find the right one, you rehab it in the right way, you get the nine bedrooms out of it, you run it really well. Then you could you could potentially have a hundred thousand dollars in net, you know, off of three to four properties. Yeah. And so I always tell people, like, what if you did move just for the next four years, yo? Yeah. yeah. And it was a it was a four years to retirement plan, and you put down five percent on four years. And what if you what if for the first property you bought, you didn't even have any roommates, you just lived in it for a year, and as soon but but you bought it with co living in mind, so it wasn't like your dream house. Yep. You move out. Guess what that one becomes? Co-living. And you yep. never actually have to live with anybody. Like you can have kids, you can have family. Yeah. As long as the next four houses you buy with 5% down on a primary residence loan, follow the co-living model, then like there's four years to retirement. Let's go. Dude, that's genius. Like it really is. Genius. Like I, I got a buddy who didn't do it with co-living. He did it with Airbnb actually, but yeah. he was like in his late twenties and he goes, 
I just don't really like working. So I'm just going to have a plan to retire in the next couple of years. And he just, he looks on the internet, spends a few weeks, studies a bunch of like, you know, he's a bigger pockets listener. So he goes out there, he decides I'm going to do Airbnb because that'll get me out the fastest. Looks over the whole country, decides this area in Nashville is going to be the best, moves there, buys it with a conventional loan, yeah. lives in it for yeah. a year, moves out, Airbnbs it, moves in a second one, now moved out, Airbnb, retired. <laughs> two years, two properties. <laughs> now, granted, the guy is like a single guy, right? But he just like, dude, if it's important, like just yeah. get it done. You know, like, yeah, yeah I love that you right. say that because it's like, it doesn't have to take 30 years to get to financial freedom or retirement. Like, that's right. Yeah. The and I found out, I found out fairly recently too, no matter how many loans you have, you can always like Fannie and Freddie will always let you get another primary. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's true. And that's cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's something that's not talked about much because everyone talked about the 10 limit, but that doesn't count your primary. You can get another one. So exactly. Yeah. Awesome, man. All right. Well, a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, I'll man. throw at you here. I want to make sure I get all the stuff. Oh, is bigger always better? I mean, do you find that typically seven bedrooms better than six and eight is better than seven or, or do you have success in smaller ones? that just are cheaper, smaller, four bedroom houses ever. It's, it's like one of those things where if it's like four or five rooms, maybe the juice isn't worth the squeeze. You might make three, four, five hundred dollars more, but is it really worth having this whole model in place that you, you need to have in place and you need to vet tenants differently. You need to treat it like a multifamily building. <laughs> in essence, what you don't tell the code enforcement officers, I yeah, said yeah. that, but you need to treat it like a multifamily building is really what you're doing. Um, but anyway, all that to say is, um, yeah, I mean, there's, I'd say the sweet spot is seven to nine. Okay. I, 10. We've got, I mean, I've got, I yeah, personally yeah. own three 10 bedroom homes. I've got one we manage that's 11, yeah. but I would say, and then of course, yeah, the duplexes. So that's why I like, that's why I like these duplexes, like that eight room, seven to eight, six to eight room is a really nice sweet spot. And so yeah. in order to do that, based on our calculations, you need, you know, our, I, I saw someone ask this in the chat, so I'll answer this right now. You need 2000 square feet usually to get six rooms. That's just what we found. Sometimes you can squeeze it in and less, but that's usually what we found. And then, and then every 250 square feet you add you, to that home. So if it's a 2,250 square foot home, I've got to be able to get seven rooms out of that. 2,500 square foot home, eight rooms, eight rooms 2,750, yeah. nine rooms, and so on. And that's kind of our little like quick at a glance formula as we're scrolling Zillow. So, um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, you, you get to 2,750, you're at nine rooms, 3,000, 10 rooms. I mean, you can... Can go bigger than that. It's just, you know, I, I think things get a little bit more complicated. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what about, what are some additional things that should be taken into account when renovating a home to be co-living? Like additional water heaters, AC units. I'm wondering, do you put two fridges in? Like, what are some things you do just to make it like, oh yeah, this is good for a co-living? Two fridges for sure. Sorry, I was reading. I was reading a comment yeah. in the in the chat when you were asking that. So, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, what are additional things you should do uh, in a co living, like when de when renovating it? So, uh, water heaters. Do you need a bigger one? Do you need two of them? Extra. Um, yeah, anything else special that you need to do? Not really. You need to make sure the 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 rooms have like airflow. That's like, mm -hmm. and, and that's honestly not a problem except the extreme. Like like right now, it's been like a hundred and six hundred and like it's yeah. been crazy in Charlotte. So like. If you have that airflow or someone did, someone really got one vent in their room like that, you're going to hear about that. Right. And sometimes you're just like, Hey, it'll get cooler tonight. Like, sorry. Like, but, but, <laughs> but like, and that sounds terrible, but like, sometimes you're not revamping the whole house. We're not doing yep. that. We're not adding 15 new ductworks to it, but you might want to think about that when you go in, we don't do new water heaters. You don't need it. It's just people are on different schedules, man. Everybody thinks like, Oh, everybody showers from s s this time to this time. Like, nah. Like I bet all of us on here have a different shower schedule, like every yeah. single person on this call, like it just doesn't happen. So, um, we, I, I, in a decade and a half of doing this, I've actually never gotten a, a hot water complaint ever. And we've had 10 people in the house. It's crazy. That's crazy to me now that I say that out loud, but yeah. Yeah. Um, parking is big, two refrigerators, one refrigerator per six, label all the refrigerator space, label the cabinet space, add an extra cabinet for people to have their own pantry space. Things like that are really important. I mean, other than that, you're just looking for like, how do I maximize the the most number of bedrooms and the largest number of bedrooms? And we always put a common space in there. We'll put a pool table and some really cool, yeah. we'll put some really cool little things in this to make it fun. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, what kind of vibe do you go for in these houses? Yeah. You get an interior designer to make them look just yeah. really cool. Yeah, we actually are. Um, 
gosh, I wish I had this house pulled up. I'd show some pictures. It might take me a minute to pull it up. But uh, so I'm, but, but yeah, you're, I mean, we're going like Edison lights with a little coffee theme. I had this one guy tell me he was going to do like a sports bar theme in a home and he was gonna put up like all these TVs. And I was like, don't do it. Cause TVs are just noisemakers. So we do not put TVs in the common space. Like everybody uh, can have a TV in their room. Yeah. You don't want something. It just causes contention. Somebody wants to watch something else. It makes noise all the time. Like it's just it's not a good idea. So we shy away from that. And I told him it was a bad idea. And I think he listened to me. We'll, I don't know if he yeah, did or sorry. not, but um you ever do anything like saunas cold plunges anything like that have you played with that you know i've got a buddy uh his name is jesse ray and he he does these entrepreneur houses they're eight they're like set seven to ten bedroom homes in phoenix arizona and you have to fill out like a five-page application you have to be <laughs> like get like i i looked over his application and i was like dude i I'm an entrepreneur and I think that's too intense for me. And it was like cold plunge every morning. And so he's kind of gone that direction. And it's, it's not, you're definitely not casting the widest net. I mean, our demographic does not cold plunge. I hate to tell you, like, they just don't, they don't, they don't hot tub, they don't cold plunge. They, they, they don't, they, they, they're, they're making a living. And honestly, they're the backbone of America in a, in a large yeah. way, but they are working and they are relaxing when they are not working. Yeah. Um, but we've not, you know, I know some people and in, in my program that have done like the luxury and that's a niche. Um, heck my wife and I even thought about that. We, we have like three or four couples that we just love to hang with. And we'd love, yeah. like, why don't we just buy this like super cool couple million dollar house in Asheville? Great view. And we all have our different suites and like, well, yeah. it'll be like friends, you know? And, and, uh, and, and anyway, my wife kind of shot it down a little bit, but, um, yeah, you can do the luxury version, but I don't recommend it because yeah. I think what we're trying to fix, what we're trying to solve here is just like, not even affordable housing, it's really workforce housing is what we're doing. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on like manufactured homes, not mobile homes, but like, you know, manufactured yeah. homes for co-living, if you play with that? Yeah, we did. We got them priced. We got, so that duplex I showed you guys, I got them priced by probably a mutual friend. I know you know this guy who who, who is a part owner in a factory here in South Carolina. And exactly that. They build them there and then they just ship them, stick them on the slab and it's like done. <laughs> the problem is they were actually more expensive manufactured yeah. than stick built. That was one. Granted, faster, but they were more. And then, and then, yeah, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to stick build a few first. I didn't want it to come and be like, that's not where the wind is supposed to be. Yeah. Like, And then you like can't do crap about it, right? Like it's, yeah. it's built. So I, I just, there's a little bit more flexibility with stick build. You can show up to the job site and be like, guys, why the heck is that being built to change that? And then, but, 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 you know, I'm a, I'm not a ground up guy. So if someone is like really experienced in that world, like more power to you probably have more confidence than I do. I was just like, no, I want to be able to like micromanage it every day, at least for the first three or four projects. And then maybe we'll look into that later, but yeah, we got it priced out. It was maybe like 20% higher, believe it or not. So I think those, those buildings I just showed you came back at like seven, 20%. That's, that's, that's an exaggeration. Maybe it was like 10% higher. Yeah, because I think I got them priced for seven hundred, and they were like seven seven or eight hundred or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that over time that's going to get better, but right now it's still yeah, just as much if not more yeah. like there. So, uh, what about uh, let's see, what are your th oh wait, did one? Do you try to put people on a similar working schedule in the same house? Like, because somebody at nights, you know, working nights might wake up the nine to fivers trying to sleep. Like, do you deal with that at all, or just not worry about it? We don't worry about it at all. And, 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 and in a way, in a weird kind of way, when you have different people on different schedules, the house actually flows better. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, like, I'll drive by one of these houses at eight o'clock sometimes, my wife and I'll just drive by, oh, let's see what's going on with that house. We're in the neighborhood. And uh, there'll be one car at like eight o'clock. And I'm like, where is everybody? Like, well, I don't understand where everybody is. And that's regular, that's a regular occurrence. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I think about my life, like I'm only actually in my house, like, yeah not even half the time like i mean including right. sleep like i'm usually just gone doing something with the family or whatever so right <laughs> uh on that note are you on the new builds are you trying to add extra insulation between rooms and floors to try to decrease sound is that a strategy yeah we, that you're doing? we aren't adding insulation but we were gonna like double sheetrock i think all the walls just to yeah, try like, yeah to do one something there yeah yeah, yeah it's we're not gonna too do some other expensive to double sheetrock so yeah lvp on all the floors we are doing some cool things with the bathrooms we're just like tiling um we're doing tile showers what were we doing in the bathroom we were doing some sort of seal just like extra seal around it so that when people splash water out it's like just bad yeah. like like little little nuanced things internet we're gonna we were gonna, one, one of the ideas we had and i don't i don't know if it's gonna happen on our first build but we we're gonna do like a ethernet cable into all the um into all the rooms so if someone wanted hardwire they could just freaking hardwire it right there like that'd That's be really cool, cool. 
um little things like that that we're doing but other than that it's bedrooms good bathroom you know and i'm assuming yeah. you're you're providing all utilities internet all that like is that everything you, you are yeah, yeah. We, in order to in order to control costs we have them approve if they're going to do like if, they, if someone's like i want a window unit it's like they have to approve that if they're like i want a heater they have to approve that if they like if they want a mini fridge they have to approve yeah. that through us before they can put one in and then we lock the thermostats actually in their membership agreements it's like hey it, it, like winter's going to be this summer's going to be this that's what it is like hey, yeah. if you, you know they initial that before they jump in so they're kind of aware of that yeah because one of the downsides i've had whenever i've paid utilities i mean i haven't had many properties like that but occasionally we get this property where it's just utilities are shared so like on a multifamily, it's yeah. like yeah. The people have their heat cranked and their window open in the you know in the in the winter and you're like right like, what are you doing? Like, you just, they right. don't care because it's not their money. So you just got to right. put in the right stipulations to try to control that. So yeah, it is what it is. It uh, is do you what have it any is. couples? Yeah. Jesse asked, do you have any couples that rent from you? Like, do you get rent by the room couples? Only if parking is not an issue at that particular house. Mm -hmm. If it's a private entrance and a private bath, then we will consider it. Okay. And the other thing to, to add to that is... Um, we will charge additional for the second second person. We'll charge like okay. a three or four hundred dollars surcharge just for utilities, basically. Do you have an issue with people hooking up? And like, has that been an issue? And then there's drama, and then they break up. Do you have to deal with that drama of young people mixed genders hanging out? I personally don't, but I, yeah. there are a few stories that kind of like <laughs> my property manager would be like, I think they're they're yeah. together or something, and I was like, okay, cool. Like, are they paying rent? Great. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah um it's not a it's not like a crazy we're we're believe it or not we're actually not that young. our average member is probably closer to like mid 30s right now oh wow yeah or maybe even a little older because we're also seeing like that 55 plus someone's on a fixed income they're willing to share they're more open to sharing now which is with the economy and so we, we've actually believe it or not, a little bit of an older crowd but yeah every once in a while a story like that'll sneak through and just try to avoid the drama as much as possible, but not not in any kind of debilitating way where it, it creates too much craziness. That's cool. I used to have <laughs> not quite the same thing, but I used to have these tenants that I rented to. They were they were uh, Mormon missionaries, so we rented to these Mormon missionaries, and like we rented to the Mormon church, and then they would put their missionaries right, into the, right. And it was a top floor of a duplex, and like these young guys, you know, they're 18, 19 years old. They've never lived on their own before, uh, and and. We would get complaints all the time, but the, the main one was one that they didn't realize like that you have to put the shower curtain inside the bathtub. So they right. put it outside. It would just pour down water below. But the funny thing is they would wrestle like full on like wrestling matches in their living room. And so the people downstairs would always complain that they're they're doing something upstairs. They were just wrestling being 19 year old kids. But yeah, the drama there of like had it had, had to always like, hey, guys, can you stop wrestling in the like every night before you yeah. go to bed? Like it's weird. So, but I hope they were just wrestling. I'm not yeah. that wasn't a euphemism. Yeah, no, they were just wrestling. I think sure, I think they were sure. just wrestling. But the people downstairs weren't so sure. So I don't know. It was a it was a fun one. So uh, yeah, fine, we man. I've had I've had tenants that complain about people you know making loud noises at night uh, next door and like you just as a landlord you just deal with that stuff. You're like, well, sorry, like. Yeah, exactly. They were just wrestling. They were being goofy boys. That's exactly what they were. It was just like such a funny like call we had to make. It's like, listen, guys, like, <laughs> can you put your shower curtain inside and just stop wrestling? Oh, funny group. Good kids, That's though. Great, I, I highly recommend if you can rent to the Mormon church, like those, they have the best tenant you could get. The Mormon church has money. They never missed a payment. Uh, yeah, they're, That's they're, they're funny. good tenants, so. That's All right, I'll, uh, let's let's end this thing, Sam. It, last question, and then I'll get some info where they can find more about you. Somebody wants to do co living. Yeah, what should they do? Like, what's first, first, second, third kind of step uh, to get into this world? Yeah, I guess if I had to break it down into three easy steps, three easy steps to financial freedom through co living. There you go. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'd say first you got to you got to find a market that is co living friendly. I mean, there definitely are co living not friendly areas. Actually, Nashville is. Nashville Brennan is actually one of them. They've they've kind of like publicly come out. They fought Pod Split. They're like, we don't want this in our city. Blah 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 blah. Sarasota is another one. Sarasota is just like, wait, anyway. I digress. But my point is like, you you've got to you've got to do your research and find an area where you can plant your flag and say, okay, this is where I'm going to be. Kind of like your buddy did with Airbnb. Like Nashville's yeah. the best for Airbnb. Like where's the best area for co living? And not that there's one best area. It really works in any kind of 
anywhere that affordable housing is an issue. I've got co-living homes in Asheville and it's 50,000 people. So it can work in any town. You got to just know where it is and where what, what's friendly to us. So I'd say that's step one, finding your area and planting your flag. The, the second step um, that really is maybe first step, actually, I would flip these two if I now that I'm putting this together, is where can you manage it? Because right now, if you just go to a normal property manager and say, I've got like eight rooms in this home, they're going to be like, yeah, you find your own way to manage that. Like we aren't managing this. And so you have to you have to either like be willing to self manage it. You have to be willing to train someone to manage it. And that's what I did. Is just like hired someone to do it. Or you have to be use be willing to use one of these platforms, these tech platforms that are up and coming. And there are there are property managers that will do co living. They're just not like advertising big. They're kind of like you got to know someone that knows someone that has two hundred rooms that they manage. Kind of like my company. It's like we manage four hundred fifty rooms, but I'm not actively like give us rooms to manage. Like, so, so you got to kind of know that I know some people in Austin that do it. I know some people in Dallas that do it. I know some people and there's, there's, there's companies and probably in just about every major city, somebody's doing it at a couple hundred room scale kind of thing. So I'd say figure out where you can manage it and what you need to do. And don't get too scared by that. It's in some ways, managing a co-living place is easier than managing a multifamily. Hmm. From a CapEx standpoint, if I have eight people paying me rent in a home, I've got one to two HVACs. If you have an eight unit multifamily, you got eight HVACs. So in some ways, it's actually cheaper and less and Great. easier. Great point. Right? Yeah. yeah. Two refrigerator versus eight refrigerators, one yeah. dishwasher versus eight, one stove versus eight. So there's there's a lot of things that actually, so don't, don't be scared of that model. Um, so figure out where you can manage, then based on where you can manage, <laughs> decide on your area. And then, yeah, you just got to evaluate a bunch of deals. Um, if I had to give a third step to it, I would just say, yeah, I guess just go evaluate a bunch of deals. Like yeah. that's where it always ends with every real estate. I feel like that's the clichéest advice I've ever given. Like go look at a hundred deals. Like I'm not Robert Kiyosaki here saying a hundred to one ratio, but that is what he said. And let's just, let's just leave it at that, but go evaluate deals. And, and then if if you find that you can't find deals in that market, maybe because you picked San Diego because you could manage there and it needs housing, but all the homes in San Diego are an 8% cash on cash, which by the way, people that go through my program, they actually do find deals in like San Diego that can cash flow. Now, not a ton, yeah, but yeah, I'm just yeah. like, you can cash flow in one of the most yeah. expensive markets in the world is really yeah. what it ends up being, right? So it's kind of cool, but I digress. So, so, so then like, if you can't find, if you can't hit your numbers, you got to just go back to A and repeat and like, where else can I manage? Yeah. Where else is a good market? And then like, okay, I've got to be able to make money. I've got to be able to hit a minimum of a thousand dollars cash flow. And that's after everything, guys. And if you can't do that, you shouldn't do co-living. And and frankly, you should be closer to fifteen, two thousand. And some of our some of our good homes, you know, will do three thousand dollars net. And that's just, you know, that's that's probably a 10 bedroom home. That's pushing the limits a little bit. That's a three thousand square foot home. But like if you're willing to go, if you're willing to do that. Um, just depends on how far you're willing to go to reach your dreams. Yeah. It doesn't take that many. That's what I love about co-living. It does not take too many. And really it's the same with assisted living and sober living, which we talked about earlier is like, it doesn't take a hundred properties to get financial freedom Yeah, uh, where you buy a house yeah. and you're making a hundred dollars a month in cash flow because you're paying 7% interest. Like it's going to take you a hundred houses to get financial freedom or a hundred units, yeah. um, to get there. But with, you know, yeah. With co-living, there's definitely opportunity. My accountant always gives me this little spiel. My accountant's, you know, in his fifties and he's always like, Sam, I see you buying all these properties and your leverage. Why don't you just take some of that cash you have and pay pay off like three, four of these properties? Then you get all the cash flow. And at first, for like the first few years, he would preach this to me. I'd be like, that's stupid, that's stupid, that's stupid, that's stupid. And then just literally like the last couple of months, I was like, because I've I've paid down some of these mortgages, appreciation. I'm like, man, it wouldn't take that much to like pay off those three houses. And I'm like, then it would do five K a month, six K yeah, yeah. a month. I'm like, dang like then you need one right yeah, so again yeah. that's like you buying a house cash it's like you know that's cash but like there there's that strategy too that's like okay like that's yeah. cool <laughs> yeah that's cool man love it all right man let's get you out of here last question uh, two more questions or one more just popped up so i'm gonna make sure i get that one are you better off finding an eight bedroom home or converting a four or five bedroom into an eight unit I mean, if you can find an eight bedroom home, that's like gold. I, I don't find that many eight bed. By the way, one of the great things about this model is like 99% of the properties I've ever bought are on market. So I'm buying on market homes, converting yeah. them into co-living. And I don't find a lot of on market eight bedroom homes. I'm finding four bedroom homes, five bedroom homes, maybe. I'm really looking for the, Krista, I'm really looking for the most amount of bathrooms, Krista. That's really what you should look for. Square footage in bathrooms. If it yeah. says, I, I have homes on septic and they told me, you know, when, when they list a home on septic, it's listed as a three bedroom, right? But I go in and I'm like, okay, bedroom, 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 nice, cool, common area. 
boom, that's seven rooms, right? So you're really looking for square footage and bathrooms. You don't really care how many bedrooms it has if you look at those other two things. Yeah. Hello, Hello man. All right. Where do people connect with you? Where do you learn about you? More about co-living th with you and getting your help and all that. Where, tell us what you're Yeah, doing. brother. I... Thank you so much for asking. I Instagram is good. I'm, I'm putting out content pretty consistently on Instagram at Sam Wiegert. Uh, my first and last name combined. Pretty easy to follow there. And then I would just say um, I do these I do these things called five day challenges. They are completely free. You can buy like a twenty seven dollar like calculator or whatever if you want. But they're otherwise they're literally completely free. Uh, and they are five days of an hour and a half a day of co living content. And it's just a deep dive into it. It's my way of giving back. Obviously, there's an offer in the program too, but it's not jammed down your throat. It's a lot of co-living. Co People get done with the program, that five-day uh, challenge. We call it the five-day challenge. And they're like, cool, like I can do co-living now. Like I get a lot of the systems. We go really, really, really deep on about an hour and a half every day for five days. And it's a lot, it's a lot, but uh, but it's a it's a it's a way to 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 really get get your yeah, to learn more about it if you're interested. Perfect. Where do they get that at? That Where's is that at scaleyourrealestate.com. Okay. www.scaleyourrealestate.com. It's a good domain. Nicely done. Yeah. The two right, R's kind of throws you off, but other than yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. All right, all. Thank Brandon, you. It's good to see you, brother. Thank you very much. I will talk to you, Sam, later. Appreciate <laughs> you. God bless you. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.